So, the scripture I'm going to read is going to be 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Yeah. So, the Bible that I worked on my sermon from was you know, the Bible that my mom is going to be cremated with tomorrow. So she's going to be cremated with the Bible. And you know, when I was scrolling through the Bible to 1 Thessalonians, there's a page in 1 Corinthians. And in her page, you know, she had handwritten at the top, our faith is the building block. And those words are so true. You know, our faith is the building block. And there's many spiritual gifts and provisions that God wants to give to us. But He won't unless we have the faith to receive them. He wants to grant us everlasting life in the kingdom of God, but He won't unless we have the faith to receive it. So, ever since, you know, I remember it was went by the food pantry in the church van when I first came to Flora, and you know, there was a search committee, and and you know Royce and Sandy were there, and John was there, and at the time Amy Bepler was there, and. Um, Rob, and I just remember someone saying, well, we like Charles, but we love his mom. <laughs> and that just kept on being repeated. I know Angie never let me forget that. You know, we like you, but we love your mom. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's fitting that this was the church where she, her final church here on earth. Because it's where she was loved. Amen. Amen. So Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him according to the Lord's word. We tell you that those who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive, and are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we'll be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other, other with these words. You know, my mom, she passed away on Thursday, and I was, I was with Jody and Juliet when I found out. You know, we've been, ever since we've been together, you know, started dating. Uh, and that was only the third time I've been to Juliet. So I wasn't very gentleman-like. She, she's carried the blunt of the load. And she, you know, she, I went there, I was going to be for a day and a half. You know, my mom was only going to be in the floor of rehab by McDonald's for two days. And Achilles and I went up to, to see Jody. And on Thursday evening, I received the phone call, and I was, and I knew it was a hospital from caller ID, and I was 100% certain, 100% that the hospital was calling me to tell me that they transferred my mom to Barnes or to Clay County. I thought she may have fallen or something, and you know, as you know, I was 100% wrong. You know, my mom was more than a mom to me. You know, and you know, up until Jody, I fell in love with Jody. She was my best friend, and she became my second best friend. But it's it's more than that. It's I was born and raised in Cincinnati. She was born and raised in Cincinnati, and 
you know, she went with me. She was my ministry partner wherever I went. And, you know, I, you know, ever since I became a pastor, you know, I, I was a, I don't know how young I am now, but I was a young adult. And there's not that many single young adults. So not only was she my mom, but she was my ministry partner and my, the person that I could just talk to as a friend, you know, just confide in. And I was that for her because we came from the same place. And, you know, you could be yourself. I, I could be myself with. And I, you know, we had something special. I think many of you saw that. <coughs> And when I was in Jody's driveway on Friday, and I was thinking of, you know, who am I going to get to preach today? Who's going to preach this Sunday? Because I know there's not a single person in here that would have held it against me if I decided not to preach. You know, I, I knew that, you know, man, because of grief, I didn't feel up to it. But there's the words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, that kept on going through my mind when I was thinking, who do I want to preach today? You know, Paul wrote, brothers, and chapter 1 Thessalonians 4.13, he wrote, brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of them who have no hope. You know, I lost my mom and I miss her very much, but I am not supposed to grieve like those who have no hope. We are not supposed to grieve like non-believers grieve. We're supposed to act, live, and behave, and when it's time to grieve, grieve, we're not supposed to do that like other people. Because Christians are supposed to have hope plastered all over our hearts. And it's because of that hope today that I'm preaching. It's the power and that hope of God. We're not supposed to live, none of us, we're not supposed to live like those who have no hope. Non-believers do that. People of other faiths may do that. But Christians are not supposed to live, behave, act, or speak like people who have no hope. Our hope in the Lord gives us the power to endure. It's our hope in the Lord that gives us the power to praise God. Even when we feel down. It, even when times are tough. Even when Paul and Silas were in prison, they sang praises to God. The point I'm trying to make, and maybe I'm not making it very well, is that Christians are not supposed to live like the people who have no hope. Because our hope is in our crucified, our resurrected, and our Savior who is coming back. Our hope is in Him. And it's that hope that we should live by, that the Holy Spirit grants us. And it's that hope that gives us all kinds of gifts, like the fruit of the Spirit. Paul writes in Galatians 5.22, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul goes on, against such things there's no law. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the sinful nat nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. I believe what Paul's saying here goes in line with 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Because when we surrender to Jesus Christ, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, that means that we've begun the, trans, the process of Christian transformation. That means that he's be, we begin the process where the Holy Spirit begins to mold us more and more like Jesus Christ. No, we never get are perfect. We never get to the point where we're our Jesus, but from the point where we're baptized and we accept Jesus to the point of our death, we should be much more Christ-like than we were you know, before we were baptized. We're 
meant to live in the hope of the Lord, in faith, and in love. Those are the three greatest spiritual gifts. We're not supposed to handle situations like non-believers. We're not supposed to get on each other's backs like non-believers. Someone is doing something little that we don't like, we need to relax and show the mercy of God that we expect to receive that mercy. If we want to nitpick, fine, but God's going to nitpick us. <coughs> God empowers those who trust in His wisdom and use His power. And you know what? When we go through grief, yes, we may cry. I've cried. But I never lost that deep down joy that God gives. That allow, because God allows us to see the big picture. And that big picture is what Sonny mentioned. Sonny in the sharing time mentioned it. Yeah, we can't describe heaven to the T. But we know what's not in heaven, right Sonny? Amen. What's not in heaven? There's no death, no sorrow, no pain. No, right. we're just praising God. Amen. We know what's in heaven, but we know what's not in heaven. When we lose things, God doesn't want us to get swept into a backward cycle. He wants us to be forward thinking and be able to see the big picture of His kingdom. And this world is fleeting. This world is coming to an end sometime. That's really the kingdom of God. And things are going to be radically different. But we're supposed to handle things different than non-Christians. We're supposed to handle financial hardship differently than non-Christians handle it. God doesn't want believers to act the same way as non-believers in that case. He wants us to trust Him and follow Him. I believe that God will provide a way for us in those situations, and we trust Him and we walk the direction He leads. God doesn't want us to act as non believers when we go through conflicts. You know, I've seen so many long term friendships end over small, silly quarrels that were just so temporary. Long friendships ending like small, simple quarrels. And that's why I preached a sermon a while back. You know, you had to treat people better than they're better than they deserve because it's just it's silly how many friendships end over just foolish things. Now the Bible teaches to avoid this that we sit down and pray, and if we think of someone that has something against us, not if we have something against somebody else, but if we sit down and we think of somebody that has something against us, we're supposed to get up from prayer, we're supposed to walk over to that person, or in our case, drive over, and try to make amends, try to end the conflict. The Bible doesn't, in that verse, the Bible's not saying, well, if I have something against something, I'm supposed to go over to someone and get it off. In other places it says that, but also, even if we don't have anything against somebody, but we feel someone does it against us, the Bible tells us to go over to that person. Now, friends, that's hard to do, and that's not what the world teaches us to do. But we're Christians, and we're supposed to live by the hope of Christ, and that's what God tells us to do. Christians are supposed to live like God expects and not like people that have no hope. You know, in marriage... The Bible teaches that the woman's body does not belong to her, it belongs to her husband. And the husband's body does not belong to him, but it belongs to the wife. The Bible teaches wives to obey their husbands, and it teaches men to love their wives like Christ loved the church. Now, can you imagine how low the divorce rate would be in our country if men even attempted because it's impossible to love your wives like Christ loved the church. But if men even attempted to love their wives like Christ loved the church, can we imagine how low the divorce rate would be? Yeah. Christ's way is different in this world. Right? You get a disagreement. Uh, I, I, a lot of my family was, well, I'm not going to 
to say that, but you know, it, you know, it, it's it's so easy to divorce in our country. It's so easy to just get in fights and combat and think, well, because so many marriages, I believe, they once were based on self-sacrificial love, but they turned into marriages based on mutual love. And that's, you know, that's not the type of love that God expects from husbands and wives or from brothers and sisters in a church. You know, because of our faith and our hope, we are supposed to handle trials and tribulations differently than those who have no faith. We're to be strong, but at the same time, we are supposed to be the embodiment of the love of Jesus Christ. We're not supposed to play the blame game when things aren't going right. We're not supposed to blame others. We're supposed to lift others up and help others gain strength, not weaken them. When we're living in the hope of Christ, we're to forgive, even when it's difficult to forgive. And sometimes it's very difficult. We're to forgive. We're to be gen generous. Even when we're facing hardships, we're to be generous as we can be. Jesus Christ came and He died for our sins. He died so that we may, those who believe in Him shall live forever in the kingdom of God. This world is fading. I want to get that across. It's fading. I'm no stockbroker. I don't know stocks. But I know the wise investment is to make investments in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Because in the United States of America, I love our country, but this is not my true home. My true home is heaven. Yeah. You know, there are times, there's a time like I'm, you know, there's times that we go through when it seems like maybe someone's reaching inside us and tearing things out. We need to remember that we have a God that loves us so very much. He loves each of us so very much. Despite our setbacks, despite our shortcomings, our flaws, we have a God who loves each of us. We should live in confidence and we should live in His strength and His wisdom. And when we get hit with stress, stressful situations, we must not run around like chickens with their heads cut off like some non-believers may do. That's not how God wants us to act. No matter how hard life is at the moment, no matter what crisis we're facing, God wants us to trust Him, to really, to truly, not just say we trust Him, but to live like we trust God. There's nothing stronger in this world than the love of God. Nothing stronger than the love of God. It's the love of God that sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be crucified for us. And in some manner, in some way, when we're going through trials, God will provide. It may not be in the way that we thought, or the way particularly that, that we're praying, but He will help us get through Our God is not a God that leaves us high and dry. Amen. Our God is a God that had His Son nailed to a cross. Our God, for us, our God is a God that has His Holy Spirit with us wherever we go. When we get hit by storms, we must not be like those that have no hope. Because we have reason to hope. We have reason to have faith. We have reason to have life transformational love. When we get hit by storms, let's use the power of God. Allow Him to let us transcend the storms. And doing so, I believe that we'll become true Christian witnesses. You know, when times are tough, Non-believers notice how Christians act. Mm -hmm. If something happens to us that would cause us to get angry, 
They notice that we get angry or we're like Jesus would want us to be. That we get hit by a storm. They notice whether we crumble or whether we stand in the hope of the Lord. Non-believers notice us. They notice what happens when we have things happen. They notice us how we handle financial hardship. And sometimes it's not right. But how we handle ourselves in tough situations can either make or break our Christian testimony to others. It's not fair, but that's the truth. Paul, when Paul said, do not live as if you had no hope, he was saying that to grieving people who are grieving. But I think that verse applies to us in all situations. <laughs> let us live, let us not live like people that have no hope, because we have reason to hope. Amen. We have reason to have faith. We have reason to love. Let us pray. Dear Father, we are so thankful that you allowed us to come here and to worship you. Father, there's things that happen in this world and, you know, because of Adam's fall, there's sin is in this world, diseases in this world, and there's things that we had no control over. But what we do have control over is our choice and whether we accept you as our Lord and Savior or not. We do have a choice in whether we will allow you to strengthen us, whether we accept your strength or not. Father, life's not measured by how long we live. It's about who we touch, what difference we make in your name. Father, let us not be focused on our length of our lives, but let us be focused on making a difference in your name. Let us be focused on sharing the gospel. But let us also live righteous lives, the lives, lives that you want us to live. Let us obey you. Let us not only call for your guidance, but let us obey you. Let us live with the hope we have in the Lord. Let us live with the joy we have for having a Lord that loves us like you do. Let us allow that, love, that joy and that hope and that love and that faith to transcend. And let's wear it on our shirt sleeves. Let's wear it, especially when we go through tough times. Father, we love you. We worship you. We honor you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. The most important decision we can make is to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's the most important decision we can make. Bill Atwood was right in the children's sermon. No, no, not that he's wrong at times in the children's sermon, but, <laughs> but, you know, if we don't accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then he died in vain for you. He, he died in vain for, you know, if we accept him, then he didn't. He went, God went through a lot of punishment, pain, scourging, <laughs> For us, the apostles, they went through stoning and flogging and being beaten within an inch of their lives to preserve the message of Christ so that we may have it. There are a lot of people that went through torture so that we would have the message to accept Jesus or reject him. Jesus was nailed on the cross. He took our punishment as being the perfect lamb.
what was coming my way, he took upon himself. So that when I stand before God, and if Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, which he is, it's by the blood of Jesus I'm saved. Not because of what I've done, not because of my works, but because of the grace through the blood of Jesus. We don't need to say 20 Hail Marys and then do a certain task. We don't need to, you know, God loves us. We're saved by faith through grace. We just need to accept Him as our Lord and Savior and surrender to Him. If you would like to do that, I invite you to come forward. You know, if you'd like to talk to someone in the church, after church, you know, we usually hang in the sanctuary a while, please feel free to, you know, I'm easy to get a hold of. A deacon, a deaconess is hard, easy to get a hold of. If you'd like to come forward and pray for a special prayer concern, you know, I invite you to do so. It would be my honor to pray with you.